Dalton Conley. You have 12 minutes. Welcome. Hola Puebla and ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, I'd like to tell you about, start with my own personal story. I grew up in the neighborhood that's depicted on the left side of the slide. It's a neighborhood of uh, poverty, of housing projects, and burnt out tenements. It was the 1970s and early 1980s in New York City. And at that time, New this area, this five block radius, was one of the three points on the world heroin triangle. Poppies were grown in Afghanistan, they were processed in Thailand, and they were shipped to this area where 70% of the heroin that was consumed in the United States came through here. And I know because we're in Mexico, I don't have to tell you that when drugs come and drug trafficking, violence and other problems follow. So it was one of the most violent neighborhoods uh, at the time. And my parents chose to live there. They were artists. My father is a painter, and my mother is an author, a writer, and they wanted to make it. And if you want to make it as an artist or a writer in the United States, you move to a big city. So my mother moved from the coal mining area of Pennsylvania, and my father moved from rural Connecticut to come try to make it in the big city, in the, in the Big Apple, as we call it, Nueva York. And um, <clears throat> because they were struggling artists, they didn't have a lot of money, so they ended up living in a poor neighborhood. But what I'm here to tell you today is that actually, I like to think of my childhood as a natural experiment. Because when you strip away the usual things that are associated with race differences or with class differences, usually white people and black people in the United States live in different neighborhoods. Usually if you're middle class, you have some money in the bank and you have a fancy house or a nice house. Uh, but when you strip away those uh, more obvious things, you see what's left, which I would argue is more powerful about race and class in the United States, and that is social and cultural capital. Social capital is just a fancy word sociologists use for connections, that my parents knew a lot of people and they knew how to work the system, and cultural capital uh, it means references, education. My mother graduated college, for instance. And so, uh, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see me there in the back, smiling like a geek. Uh, my mother's not a very good photographer, so my sister is in the front row, cut off. And those are our neighbors. And much of my work, my, my research, has been trying to figure out why I'm up here today and my neighbors are not. Fast forward a few years to middle school. There I am looking geeky again, playing the clarinet. And there is my friend from the neighborhood, Jerome McGill. A few, a little while, a few weeks after this was taken, he was hanging out in our neighborhood uh, at night, talking to a friend, and a shot erupted from a building across the street that was one of the burnt out tenements that now served as a heroin shooting gallery or as a crack house. The bullet ricocheted off the brick and struck him in the neck. And from that point forward, age 13, he was paralyzed. So much of my, my whole life has been about trying to figure out why I'm here able to stand on my own two legs and people like Jerome are not. Now, of course, we could just say it was just a random fluke accident. It was a bullet that ricocheted off a, a building and hit him. So maybe it really is just luck, his bad luck and my good luck. But when you add up a number of experiences, Jerome's, the fact that uh, my other friend from Little League baseball team, Mark Ramirez, ended up serving 20 years in jail for uh, getting mixed up with the wrong people when he was age 19. And meanwhile, I, by accident, I should say, burned down my friend's apartment set fire to his apartment when we were playing a game there, and yet I didn't get, I didn't get in so much trouble that I'm not here. So, <clears throat> if I wanted to answer this, well, little did I know when I went into this to try to investigate this, I was entering this great debate. What I like to call, what people call nurture versus nature, nature versus nurture, I like to call Watson versus Watson. Jim Watson, represented by the double helix on the right, is the co-discoverer co of DNA, 
and that argues for the importance of genes. But uh, John Watson is a famous American behavioralist psychologist who argued, who was famously misquoted as saying that give him any kids and he can turn any kid, uh, if he gets them early enough, into a doctor and turn it the, or a criminal, just based on how he upbrings them. And that's the, the power of nurture. So if I really wanted to unravel this, I would have to do a pretty devious experiment. I would take two twins, identical twins at birth, I would kidnap them, and I would put one in my neighborhood where I grew up, and I would sneak the other one off to, let's say, Greenwich, Connecticut, which is basically the richest town around New York City. And then I would follow them for about um, 35 years, spying on them, stalking them, um, hiding in the bushes, and watch them and take notes. And, and then after 35 years, I would know what is the effect of nurture, what is the effect of our social environment net of our genes because they are identical twins. But of course, that wouldn't really answer the questions about race or class. Actually, and it wouldn't even answer the question about nurture because it could be a fluke accident that one of them ended up better off than the other one. So I would have to recruit a bunch of you and we'd have to do this about at least 20 times, steal 20 sets of twins and randomly assign them to different families. And if I want to know the question about race, I would have to team up with Craig Ventner and do a little genetic engineering, and we'd have quadruplets and make two turn out light skin, two turn out dark skin, take one of each color and stick them in my neighborhood and one of each color and stick them in the rich area. Obviously, can't do that. But even if I could, I realized shortly after that a thought experiment that that wouldn't be good enough. So I'd really have to separate them as conception. Because as it turns out, which I'll explain, uh, how we are, what the social environment our mothers experience while we are in their womb is probably the most critical window of development in setting our life chances. This theory comes from the work of a British epidemiologist named David Barker. It's called the fetal origins hypothesis. And it came from the observation that kids who were in utero, in their mother's womb, during the brief uh, hunger winter in the Netherlands during World War II uh, in winter of 1945 um, were worse off 50 and more than 50 years later in terms of their health outcomes than kids who were either born just before or conceived just after that uh, time period. This is a picture of the Allies dropping emergency food rations into the Netherlands. <clears throat> so, so I thought, well, maybe maybe these prenatal conditions are what is explaining why my friends were worse off than I was. What's explaining race and class differences in the United States is the conditions of their moms while they're pregnant. So to answer this, I turned to what I, what's called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics, or I call America's Family Tree. They start with 5,000 American families uh, in 1968, and they followed them every year since. And if you're born into the family, you get the PSID gene. If you shack up with, a, with one of the PSID families and then move out, you get the PSID virus. I call it a sociologically transmitted disease, STD. So I followed the kids who were born, who were born into the, par the parents of the PSID families and watched them grow up, not hiding in the bushes, but just downloading the data every year. And uh, I want to back up for a second and mention that the stress of the mothers, we follow the stressful events that the mothers are experiencing during pregnancy, and stress triggers a response, a hormonal response, in a pregnant woman or in you and me. If, you're, if a lion roars at you or if your boss screams at you, all of a sudden you release cortisol, and the tricky thing is <clears throat> that this cortisol diverts resources away from your baby, away from the fetus, uh, because you want to live another day, um, it's more important for you to have energy to run away from the lion or to scream back at your boss than to be able to make a baby or to add to flesh to that baby. Moreover, the cortisol actually seeps into the baby's bloodstream itself and rewires them and changes the priorities for the baby because the baby thinks, my God, this is a stressful environment I'm going to go into and maybe I'm even coming out now because one of the, th the effects of cortisol is to trigger premature labor. So the baby will mature her lungs so she can breathe and neglect things like bone development and brain development. <clears throat> 
So what I did was I f followed these PSID families and looked at mothers who had a, 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 a copacetic, a, a calm, a pacific uh, pregnancy one time, maybe the first time, and then the second time they ended up stressed out because there was a death in the family or family member lost their job or what have you, or there was gun violence in the neighborhood, and the second sibling is born low birth weight. That's less than 2,500 grams. And I followed them. Now, these are kids from the same family, growing up in the same household for over 20 years, and I find that those kids who were the low birth weight pregnancy ended up 50% less likely to graduate from high school uh, in a timely fashion than their normal birth weight siblings. 50%, that's bigger than the effects of race in America, bigger, bigger than the effects of poverty, bigger, bigger than the effects of almost anything. Um, <clears throat> we've replicated this with twin studies and so forth to tr really try to factor out genetics, and we found, and others have found, that if you want to know what a pound of flesh is worth, a pound of birth weight, the answer is 7% of, of your lifetime income. Um, if you're a pound heavier, you're more likely, you'll earn 7% more. <clears throat> Uh, probably understandable, this, this extends to things like educational performance. Low birth weight kids are, are about twice as likely to end up in special education or be held back or be classified as learning disabled. <clears throat> so this might sound like a pretty um, depressing talk, right? For all of us, it's all over, forget about it, right? Um, uh, we can blame our mothers if they they smoked or did drugs or were stressed out during the pregnancy, but if this is the most important window, it's really all over. But I want to leave you with a hopeful message, and that is now that we know how important prenatal conditions are, we can do something about it. Because if you think about most of what we do in society to equalize chances, it occurs much too late. It occurs in high school, it occurs in elementary school, it occurs in families' nutrition once the kids are born. But rarely do we really take seriously the conditions when a woman is uh, pregnant in terms of how it's going to affect her kids 50 years later. And it's also a hopeful story because Mother Nature is no dope. So when kids experience stress in utero, um, they actually learn to deal with stress better because the signal from the environment is that this is going to be a crazy world. Time is over, I'm sorry. Un aplauso, por favor, para... Dalton.